I'm Maurice McDavid, host of Black, Brown, and Bilingue, a part of the Education Podcast Network, just like the show you're listening to now. Shows on the network are individually owned, and opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other interesting education podcasts at edupodcastnetwork.com. Teaching While Queer is a podcast for 2S LGBTQ plus educational professionals to share their experiences in academia. Hi, I'm your host, Brian Stanton, a theater pedagogue and educator in New York City. And my goal is to share stories from around the world from 2S LGBTQ plus educators. I hope you enjoy Teaching While Queer. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Teaching While Queer. I'm your host, Brian Stanton. I'm so excited to have with me today, Andre Zarati. Hi, how are you doing? Hey, how are you? I'm doing good. Doing good. Excited to be here. I'm so excited to have you. I'm so excited that I got a little tongue tied there. So that's fun. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself to our guests, our our audience? (laughs) Yeah. Hi, everybody. Um, My name is Andre. My pronouns are he, them, she. Um, I am currently an adjunct professor. I was a middle school teacher for the last 10 years. Um, Currently, I'm also just working on a really cool endeavor called House of Legends, where it's like a school model that centers queer youth. Um, And I'm really just focusing on making sure that LGBTQ students are really seen in schools and that they're represented and that they have a space like that really focuses on themselves. I want to verbalize this before we get on with the interview that we need to make sure that we circle back on House of Legends because I have questions Uh, because it sounds awesome. Um, Can you do me a favor? Uh, Because this is the first time that I've heard the pronoun Sha. Can you just tell me a little bit about it? Oh, yes. Great question. So Sha is a Tagalog pronoun um, from the Philippines. My family's from the Philippines. And I add Sha at the end of it just as a reminder to myself that my ancestors pre-co- pre-colonial Philippines and the way that we've always looked at our language is that we didn't have binaries. And so what we use Sha for he, her, them, it was just the same pronoun for each one. So it's just a reminder to myself that that's where I came from. Those are my ancestors. And I proudly wear the Sha pronoun. I absolutely love that. And I love that like so many cultures out there and so many languages world languages actually aren't in the binary yeah i would love for someone to do a study of that like just oh yeah you know, the languages of the world and be like these ones are in the binary and these right. ones aren't and like and then the next question is like why right like, where right. Did, where did the binary get existed or right. get put into existence <laughs> right and, you know, it's uh, one of the things that I'm doing. I forgot to add, I'm also a, a doctoral candidate at the University of Pennsylvania oh, awesome. School of Education. And my dissertation and research study is actually um, surrounding Philippinex queer youth. And I've been doing a lot of reading around the history of the Philippines as it comes with gender and sexuality and how a lot of that stuff is kind of left out and forgotten. And so part of the my study and part of like what I'm doing is like looking back into my roots so that I can really just live into my authentic power um, as a person, as a human being, and as a Phil Pinex person. I think that's so interesting. There's a couple of things that you said that I find fascinating. One, I have not heard the X applied to other cultures outside of Latinx. Ah. Um, and I know because I, I mean, I grew up in Southern California. I lived in Texas for a while. So I know a lot of people who would fall into the Latinx community. And I've seen a lot of pushback about it. Right. Um, and also the development of Latin A, which is more consistent with Spanish and Latin languages um, and how you would pluralize, you know, right. um, pronouns or people or and whatnot. And so I think that's super cool that also yeah. is a subculture of. Um, yeah. um, I will say then, that it's a little bit of similarly to Latinx, there has been a lot of debate and conversation around it as well um, about how like, oh, we're like people want to stick with Filipino um, 
in it, but I, you know, just, just like how I feel about Sha, like, I feel like it should just be applied. And I let people make that decision. I like Philippin X because I feel like it's more inclusive. And so I just stick it on to a lot of the things that I do and a lot of the things that I say. Yeah, I love that. It's funny. I think a lot about um, when, when this conversation starts happening, I think a lot about um, Legally Blonde. <laughs> um, so for those like in the movie Legally Blonde, there is a lesbian character who is a, a feminist and she has a conversation about gendered language. Mm. And so she starts complaining about the word semester and talking about it, how it should be Ovester. And that's uh, an example of like where gendered language can create an issue. And right. what I think is so interesting is that nobody bats an eye for masculine gendered language. Right. Like right. Human, mankind, all of those things are okay. But as soon as you start veering from that and saying something that might be different is where we start getting the pushback. Right. Um, right. And so you see that happening in lots of different cultures. It's not just English. Um, like even just the idea of like womankind or right. chair person, um, right. you know, like these things that are happening create a lot like a lot of stirring. It's like when people say things like, well, we can't say Merry Christmas anymore. Well, nobody's saying that, but like <laughs> <laughs> no one, no one is saying that you have to say chair person. We're just right. recognizing that this woman is not a chair man. Right. This woman is the chair person. This woman is the chair, maybe just that part, you know, Um, or this non-binary or transgender person is not the man, unless they are, um, that is being identified just by using gendered language. Right, right, right. So fascinating. Yeah, and I I would say that, you know, to add on to that, as we're talking about language, I feel like. Um, one of the things that I've been actively trying to do, especially since I've been going back into like looking into my roots and using the pronoun and change, um, using Philippin X is like trying to remove gendered language from my language and my speak. And I'll admit that it's really hard because you've been like, we've been raised to just continually say it. And so I openly admit, I say this all the time to my students too, that I'm going to make mistakes and I would appreciate it. People like, you know, call me in on it. Yeah, there's something I learned from my um, my college professor. And it's funny because it's like my second master's degree and I'm still learning new things and, and ways of approaching things. And she said, um, I'm speaking in rough draft. And ah. so like these conversations where we're kind of having to come up with things on the top of our head, right. like those are conversations that we're having in rough draft because we right. didn't get to think about them beforehand and that's where mistakes are going to happen and the caveat is what you do after the mistake right 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 it, it's how you respond to it that's important um whether it be about pronouns or if it's something with yourself you just make the mental note of like oh shoot i just used a masculine word when i meant to be more general than that Right. I'll have to, you know, remember that specific word and come up with a solution for it and try to work it into my vocabulary. Right. It, it's it's just about how you respond to it. But yes. I think you're right on point with that. It's like we're make we're gonna make mistakes and it's important to learn from those mistakes and move on. Right. Agreed. Hundred percent. So let's talk a little bit what it was like for you as a queer student. Yeah. You know, I always start off uh, talking about how when I was younger, I feel like I knew pretty early that I was different from what a lot of my classmates and peers were were feeling. And um, so as a preface, I went to basically I went to Catholic school my entire life, K-8, 9-12. And so there's a narrative that's always pushed in Catholic school. And um Ever since I was younger, and I say this in a lot of my speeches in second grade, that was the first time someone called me, um, trigger warning, content warning, a faggot. Um, And it has always stayed with me every year after that. And to be quite honest, like I felt like I've heard that word being thrown at me every year, um, even as an adult. And so what it makes me think Um, about when I was younger was that the feelings that I had about myself were wrong. 
or I, I, I desperately wanted, you know, a change. And I, I consider myself a very creative person. Um, I love the arts. Um, and I knew that when I was younger, like I loved drawing, I loved music. I just liked being in that realm, being creative. Um, and that showed up a lot in play. And I, 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 as an educator now, I'm a big proponent of imagination um, as a pedagogy. And mm-hmm. because that goes away um, somewhere in our childhood where we just like no longer use our imagination. And, and um, when I was younger, I was always playing around with what the societal norms or what Catholic school was telling me or what I was feeling from my family and the people around me. Like I wanted to play dress up and I wanted to wear that dress. I wanted to um, dance around to some of my favorite music, but I was being constantly told by people around me, no, that's not what a boy does. We don't do that. Um, and I was constantly made fun of uh, for it, especially when I was a kid. And one of the, my favorite things is me and my friends used to play Power Rangers and yes, I was just thinking about this. Yes, Go on. <laughs> I, we used to play Power Rangers all the time, and I wanted to be the Pink Ranger every single time. I was like, I don't care um, what you want, but I'm going to be the Pink Ranger. And people be like, that's not a boy color. That's not a boy in it. And I was like, I don't care. I'm going to be the Pink Ranger. And so I'm the Pink Ranger every single time. Um, and I'm actually proud of little Andre for sticking by that a lot and you know and i'll also say that um when we when we were younger we had like gamecube and nintendo 64 and when we played mario kart i would always pick peach or daisy or birdo as my character i just wanted to be them but i kept constantly being told like you can't you can't but i still chose them anyway so little andre thank you for sticking by that decision but what I mean by like being constantly told is that throughout my childhood i kept thinking damn like why do you think this way? Why are you like this? And you you internalize like there's something wrong with you. Um, and I'll be honest, like that kind of stayed with me all the way through high school. I didn't actually figure out or like do start doing that self-healing work until I got into college. Like that's when um, I started like accepting more of my identity. I met more people who were like me. And so they kind of like helped me out with that. But a lot of my childhood was like burdened with like, trying to be somebody I wasn't. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a lot there that I like, for those of you who are listening to this podcast and did not see me freak out on camera, um, (laughs) as soon as you started talking about playing imagination, my head went to like, oh, I used to remember playing outside and I was always the pink rager and I was always Storm from X-Men. Like, Uh, yes. And I was like 100% okay with it. And like, living my best life and so as soon as you said that I was like heck yes Yes. um that was also my reality at the time and then like as you went on I just started thinking about my own experience and how like I had queer experiences in high school and I started to come to terms with myself and a couple episodes ago I talked about um a genuine experience of like queer euphoria, uh, which actually happened here in New York City. The first time I came here was like the first time I felt like 100%, I don't have to hide who I am because every single person on this trip with me knew who I was, right? Yeah. And so then I went to college and I'm just thinking back at like my first uh, queer student union meetings and whatnot and the group of friends that I got from that and the camaraderie that happened and... I'm just going, yep. So that's a lot. Like I had these queer experiences and I had this queer identity when I was in high school, but like it really didn't blossom until, until college. And so many of us have that experience. And to some extent, I'm really happy about the time we're living in right now and seeing how that experience can happen earlier in life because what you have to be 21 to figure out who you are. Like that's crap. And I think what's interesting too, is like, I, I think about, um, especially in the, I want to say middle school years, um, as I think people started to recognize, I mean, I, I was recognizing it, but I think people were starting to recognize that I was different. They started, I, I was put into more sports. Like I was like forced into playing sports. So I, 
played hockey, soccer, and I feel I felt like a lot of this was trying to make me a little bit more tougher because that was just yeah. not reality. I mean, they didn't they didn't put you into like a basic sport; they put you into a contact sport. Yeah, contact sport. But the only sport that stuck with me out of all the sports that I played was tennis. <laughs> not a contact sport not a contact sport <laughs> favorite one it was the only one that stuck um but yeah like um I just remember like even I was getting advice from some of my friends they were like your hands are too loose you need to like clench your fists um a little bit more and so I always took that as like a symbolism for like I was like holding it all in when I was younger like always like trying to like when I I would remember catching myself whenever I, my hands were just free flowing and be like, Oh, I gotta walk like this or like have my hands like really clenched. Um, and I think I was like super obsessed and also dur- around puberty, like my voice was higher than others. Um, and so when puberty was happening, a lot of people were like, you're not going through puberty. You're not going through. And like, I was like really conscious or people made me really conscious that I felt like, I had to exert to people that I was a man, um, which is like not the case anymore. Like, I don't care what you think. Um, But back then it was just like um, a lot of my childhood, a lot of middle school and just a lot of the surrounding just made me feel like I had to do that. And not to mention, I went to an all boys (laughs) high school. And so um, that played a huge role in the way that I felt like I had to carry myself um, in high school. So you have this kind of culmination and I've talked about intersectionality a lot uh, with other folks on the podcast. Do you feel like um, there was a lot of crossover in that kind of self-consciousness coming from being both Catholic and Filipino? Yeah. Um, A hundred percent. Definitely. Like I felt like, you know, you would attend mass or you would be in classes as in Catholic school where they talk about, how being a homosexual is a sin, like it's not okay. And um, I remember, I could just remember one of the textbooks, like having it italicized and I would read it and I'm like, no, that's not me. (laughs) I had to convince myself that it wasn't me. And then because um, a lot of uh, Philippinex families also were raised Catholic, um, there was also, it was just like a taboo topic. Like we were not gonna talk about that and so um I felt like a lot of like you said the intersections of my identity just made it I feel like a lot more harder for me to just like you know really showcase who I am and showcase um myself um and even when I um let people into my life in college um when I was like I was starting to tell people slowly and actually even that situation was pretty chaotic um as I remember it um, I still felt like I had to play a game, like two roles, because I was um, I was out to people in college, but I wasn't out to people at home. Um, yeah. And so it was I was it was like still I was balancing back and forth and code switching in uh, many different situations. For sure, I once like I think it's interesting that there and. I am not of either of these cultures, so I could be very wrong in saying this. But most of the Philippinex people that I know are um, are Catholic, and there's like yeah. a huge, like a strong Catholic influence. And like I once had a girlfriend. <laughs> I, this one time I had a girlfriend. Multiple times I had a girlfriend, but this specific instance I had a girlfriend who was uh, Philippinex and Catholic. And at the time, I was not coming out to people with my queer identity. We had broken up for whatever reason. And she slapped me because I'm pagan. I'm a Wiccan. uh, Mm -hmm. And quoted, you know, thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. And I just started, like, that was my, it wasn't my introduction to Catholicism. Because honestly, my introduction to Catholicism was my, my grandmother's Latin mass when she died her funeral mm. um and i was like what look at all this right, pageantry flat. they're up there in golden right. and shiny clothing and they're singing and right. and whatnot um but i just found that so fascinating it was my first understanding of like 
how the teaching of Catholicism can can impact people. Yeah. Um, because I didn't grow up in organized religion, and I'm very thankful to my parents for that. Because yeah. I, I do believe that I would have had a lot harder time uh, with my own queer identity had I been uh, in, in that environment. But it was it's such an interesting, poignant experience. And we're great now. She and I are Facebook friends. It's fantastic. We talk <laughs> I've, helped her with, I've helped her with stuff with her kids. Like, it's yes. fine. Um, but it's like this vivid memory. And it's like, it's the thing I associate with Catholicism and Philippine X people. And thank right. you for introducing me to this term because I'm going to actively work on it. Yeah. My vocabulary during it, this episode. Nice. Um, so you started kind of really coming of age, not coming of age, but coming to terms with your identity in college. And so now you're an educator. Yeah. And how do you think that your experience as a child kind of helped shape your interactions with your students? Okay, so I always tell people, and I talk about this a lot, um, that when you come out or let people in once, that it doesn't end there. It just keeps going and going and going. And like, so every stage of life, there is a letting people in scenario. <laughs> and going into the teaching profession, when I first started out, I will admit I was so scared. Um, even though I had just came from college and just let everybody know that I identify as gay and I'm part of the LGBT community, the minute I stepped into the classroom to the teaching world, I, I, I went back in. And I think the part of the reason why was um, I, I first taught in a school in Chicago, we were... <laughs> Um, this is a little bit of like, oh, I like had some flashbacks. Um, even though we were a public school, we were housed in a Catholic school right next to a Catholic church. And so the students who predominant, the students and families who predominantly um, joined our school went to that church. And so I already had so much anxiety about being myself when I started as a teacher that I never talked about it. So I, I, being transparent in the beginning, I was just like, I pretended that I wasn't. Um, and I know, and that was like a survival tactic, you know, like it was just kind of like, I just didn't want to go through all of the, um, or at least what I thought in my head as all of the issues that I thought were going to come up because of that. Mind you also within those, um, I was at that school for six years. In the first two years, there were also some other queer teachers that were open and out. And I just saw a lot of backlash that was really harmful, I think, for me to see as a queer teacher. And I was like, oh, it's not safe to just be out like that. Um, and so I kept it in a lot. Although my students, um, we talk, I taught the same group of students for four years. So I had them from fifth grade to eighth grade. Um, and in the, in the fifth and sixth grade year, a lot of them always were just like, who's your girlfriend? Ooh, like all that stuff. Then I think mid sixth grade, they just stopped asking. So sixth or eighth grade, it was just like, bloop, no one ever asked me ever again. And so I still am in contact with a lot of, um, the students that I taught from my original class. And they were just like, um, we knew. We just, <laughs> we just didn't talk about it. We just didn't talk about it with you. And also, and I felt, you know, thinking about it, I was just like, oh, and also um, I didn't give people, or I didn't get, obviously, like, I just was, like, scared for my own, and just, like, from my past history as a child, and um, in school, I was really afraid to do it, but what really um, changed is one day, my mentor, um, my mentor teacher, um, shout out to Caroline James, um, she we were having a conversation about it um, in a meeting and she said to me, I can tell you're holding a lot in and I can tell like, you're just not yourself. And I was like, mm, yes. You know, I was just, she's like, you have so much infectious energy and the students see it, but like, you're missing a piece. Like you're missing the whole, like um, just being yourself and openly stating it unapologetically. And I, and I, you know, I explained to her, I was like, I'm like afraid to do that. And then 
she asked me the question that I that like changed my mindset around this. She said, I just want you to think about how what message are you sending to queer youth when you're not talking about your identity? What like what the message that you're sending them is, oh, I'm supposed to hide. I'm not supposed to talk about it. Um, and then it hurt even deeper <laughs> because uh, she was like, I just want you to think about little Andre. If he was sitting in your classroom and like experiencing what you experienced and knowing and thinking like, oh, I think my teacher is queer. Um, and then you're just like not talking about it. And I remember going home and I was like in tears. Like I went through this whole like thing and I will be honest, like it took me a year or two to fully embrace that and fully like, I'm going to do this and I'm going to be really unapologetic about it. And when I did and I put my first pride flag up and um, I introduced myself um, in he, them pronouns and I talked about my identity, it was just such the sweetest relief that I felt because then I could just be a whole me in in the classroom. And the fears that I had around people or the backlash that I was going to get just wasn't there. Um, it just wasn't present. And one thing that I've learned is that a lot of the students and families that I worked with in the communities, they just loved me so much that like, that's not the core, like that one thing wasn't gonna change um, our relationship as a community. And I would say that I, I was sad that it took so long, but I would say that I'm really appreciative of that journey and of that moment with my mentor around flipping the question around like, what message are you sending? Because as teachers, as educators, we're, definitely role models and they, they see what we do and they can pick up those subliminal messages um, whether we like it or not. And so that was just such a pivotal moment in, in my teacher identity. Absolutely. I'm just thinking that she gave you like that RuPaul's Drag Race moment where it's like the little picture, like what would you say to little? Yeah. <laughs> it's just yes. like, so you got a finale moment as it were. <laughs> Yeah, I, I did have a finale moment. And that's a- <laughs> <laughs> oh, and it, it also got me thinking like, this is dear, dear folks at home. This is where my ADHD comes out is that like, people start saying things and then my brain goes to song lyrics. Because um, I've always been like a singer and yeah. musician and, and I you know, I teach theater and musical theaters involved with that. So I just started thinking about Stephen Sondheim. And I thought, thought about Into the Woods and there's this wonderful song called Children Will Listen um, and it's like careful the things you say children yeah. will listen and the other part of that that's not included in the song is children will see what you don't say and I think yes. that's so important also like the, the point that your mentor made is really poignant because I think that that's even more noticeable. And especially when you have a world that's full of bystander syndrome right. um, and horrible things are happening, but nobody feels that they have to step up and say something about it. Right. That goes noticed. It's what perpetuates the bystander syndrome is because nobody is saying that nobody's actively saying this isn't okay. Right. And so right. I think that's so like, what a great mentor to have. Congratulations oh, yeah. on that. <laughs> it was funny because it was just like one of those situations where she was just like, yeah, we're not going to talk about test scores today. We're not going to talk about, I want to talk about you because I, I, I've been in your classroom for so long and I'm noticing something that's missing. Um, and we had that, it was such a, it was like one of those like after school three hour conversations that, um, I think really pushed me to think differently about like my purpose and um, even through the small things like hanging a pride flag in your classroom is um, life changing in many ways. Absolutely. And I think there's another, there's another part of that too. I just, I finished a couple months ago. I led a PD um, for an organization that was on identity in the classroom and how you show up in your classroom. And so we walked through, you know, what does identity mean? And I gave several, you know, definitions, including Dr. Seuss. 
Um, and then, and then I asked them, okay, so give me your one second, one minute identity. This is who I am. And I said, great. One, did any of you feel com uncomfortable sharing any of that information? Mm. No. Okay. Two, what one thing can you take away from that list and still be yourself? And they said nothing. And I said, okay, great. Now let's talk about queer identity. Queer identity is one part of someone's whole identity. And lots of people are asking us to take it away from our teaching. Take mm -hmm. a part of ourselves away from ourselves for the sake of teaching and still be the same person. Right. Right. Cannot be done. Right. Now I know it's a simple, like, nobody said I'm heterosexual. I didn't even say it, that I was, I was queer. I said, I'm a father. I'm a husband. I host a podcast called Teaching While Queer. My pronouns are they, he, they. Like, I never explicitly said I was queer. I just started naming things about me. Right. And it's just one aspect of our personality. And I find it so frustrating when people are like, I don't know why it has to be your whole personality. I'm like, it's it's not wow. my whole personality. First of all, who doesn't love rainbows? Like, right. if you don't love rainbows, you have like a serious problem. Yeah. Um, and then, and, and, and two, like, have you looked at yourself and really understood how heterosexuality is your whole personality? Right. Right. Because right now you're telling someone that their queer personality is their whole personality for the sake of being queer. Right. Right. So right. it's an interesting thing. It is one portion of who we are, and yet it seems to be the thing that is most talked about. Yes. Um, and especially, I think, you know, I, I often think about, like, as an educator, um, how easy it is for a lot of my um, colleagues who identify as hetero to share they're getting engaged, they're having, they're getting married and how um, queer people are expected to hide it and not talk about, it. that's not a conversation that we should have in the class. But literally the person next door just told everybody about her and her husband. So I'm confused about like why my milestones or queer milestones don't count. And um I I was in a, like, I had a colleague who had a similar, like, a situation that really broke my heart around, like, um, sharing good news. And it really, it really tainted the way I thought about, like, oh, I really have to straighten up as a teacher and not um, share much of my identity. But that was okay, early. Hold on. Uh, hold on. I really want to point out something that you said. We've been talking about language. I really have to straighten up what I say about myself. Mm -hmm. language man yeah crazy and it's and it's it, and I, I say that intentionally as a like that was where my mind was like going and it was re it's it's all it's always it has been really hard to undo but that was like when i saw somebody else hurting or when some other traumatic moment was happening i was like no can't happen to me and i like did all the things that i had to do to protect uh, myself and, and a lot here's of the thing like i can tell i can tell a classroom full of kids that i have a husband and all i've done is tell them who i love right the teacher next door tells me that she just got pregnant she literally just told her students that her and her husband are fucking yeah, 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 yeah. that they're having sex right and like <clears throat> that is mind-boggling to me that right. there's this huge disconnect because we love baby everybody loves babies like y'all right. the students know how babies are made right um and if that's an okay conversation to have because i'm not saying it's not then me right. sharing basic information about having a spouse uh should be fine across right. the board it's interesting so i'm glad you brought that up because actually there is another situation where um a queer couple at my school said they were having a baby and then uh, there was a lot of backlash. And I'm like, that's not a conversation that we can have, but it's like the, what you just said about like um, someone saying that they're pregnant, like 
What? <laughs> wait, wait, wait. One, of, yeah. one of them, the direct result is sex. Yes. The other one is either adoption <laughs> or science. Right, right, right. Um, and so it's interesting that the you know that you brought that up. I always think about the double standards um, that people are having around like who can say what and who gets to share their life, who gets to be authentic about their life, and it's just kind of like. Um, but I'm just so glad I'm now like out of that place, um, and that I'm so I've I've been more comfortable with myself so that I could and that I'm able to share my identity and really the work the way that I want to work. You've talked a bit about having seen like experiences for other queer teachers that had to deal with anti-queerness and uh, uh, anti-queer behavior, but have you ever had to deal with anti-queer behavior yourself, either from students or administrators or parents? Oh yeah. So actually what's interesting is I think the older I got, the more I picked up on it, um, particularly from adults. I didn't really get it from a lot of the students or from a lot of the youth. I think um, I built such solid relationships with uh, families and with students that that wasn't really an issue. But I think um, I encountered a lot of colleagues who um, didn't like that I had the flag up, didn't like that, um, didn't like that I was hosting a GSA um, at the school. Um, and actually there was this one instance and this one actually like messed with me a little bit. I was like teaching a lesson from broad to specific. And I actually used my dissertation topic as an example, um, where I talked about like LGBTQ people is a very broad topic. And so I wanted to narrow it down to Philippinex queer youth. And so I showed them how like you narrowed it down. And one of the teachers heard me teaching broad to specific in that way and said that it's not up to me to be talking about that in the classroom. It should be the parents who say it's okay because if I had a child in your classroom and you were teaching that, I would pull them out. And It literally uh, isn't about the queerness, though. It's about the process. Right. And I was telling them, like, I'm using my dissertation as an example because I want to show you that I still use this as a 30 year old in grad school, like I'm still using it. It's relevant. Right. It's relevant. And the funny thing was, is that they all got it. Like they were like, got it. And like, they started narrowing their research projects and I was like, great, great lesson. But then a teacher had pulled me aside and said that um, if their child was in my class, that they would pull them out. And I was like, I was like confused about the feedback I was getting and um, it was funny because they were like, uh, I'm, I'm an ally. Trust me, I'm an ally. Oh, no. But oh, no. I don't want my children knowing about that unless it comes from me. And I was like, mm, I don't know. But that one messed with me a little bit. I'm not going to lie. Like I, um, when, because they directly said it to my face during a prep period and I, I was thinking about it for months. Like I couldn't Did, stop thinking Those about conversations it. that happen during prep periods like really stick with you. They're yeah. like the worst. I had one, uh, I had my prep period at the first period of the day and I had one like right before I was going to get ready to teach everybody. It always happens right so before like your prep mess, period. Mess you up, right? right? Right. Always right before you're about to teach because I was about to teach right after that too. So I was like a little frazzled and I, I think it's lesson I changed the topic because I was just like really frazzled that that and that's the stuff that really bothers me is that we do it consciously or subconsciously we follow the feedback even though we don't agree with it right you know what I mean because I found myself doing stuff like that when I would give feedback I would sub like personally it was subconscious I subconsciously removed queer identity from certain things and it was just I don't know in, in retrospect, I was really angry with myself, but I didn't do it on purpose, right? Like I just internalized this information, this feedback. Right. I, you know, and in hindsight or, you know, having, you know, a witty theater teacher on hand is always helpful, but I'd have turned to her and been like, I would like for you to look up the term performative allyship. Have a great day. Yes. <laughs> do you always have that moment where you're like, 
dang, I just came up with the best comeback, but it was like three o'clock in the morning, two days later. Swear. <laughs> but what I will say is the one thing that really kept me going there was um, I, that was a school that I just, I was in Chicago for a few years and then I moved to a different school in a different city. And I did put my pride flag up and proud. Um, I even on the first day of school, I had like some rainbowy outfit. And I just remember some uh, some of the queer students that ended up joining the GSA later walked into my classroom. They weren't even in my class. They walked into my classroom, they looked around and I felt like, and I always talk about this, like they, I got this code word that was <laughs> like, we see you, you see us. They walked in and they were just like, it's so bright in here. I love it. It's so bright in here. And that was like a code word to both of us where we were like, okay, I see you, you see me, I got you. Like, um, That's and it was beautiful. great. Yeah. Cause I think about like a lot of what I try to do is to be a beacon, right? Yeah. Like a beacon of light. And so if to get that feedback would be like so meaningful because that's, what I was trying to do. Right. You know, it was my favorite so cool. feedback. And I always stick that in my brain when I do this work. I, th I think about the four of those students who came in and set it together. And um, I was like, okay, I I'm going in the right place, right direction for myself and for them. So. So you got this wonderful advice from your mentor. I want to turn the tables now and put the, you in the position of being the advice giver. So yeah. you're talking with a, a teacher who's coming out of their student teaching. They're ready to go into the classroom, but they're unsure if they should be their authentic self. What yeah. kind of advice would you give them? It's funny because I feel like I would give the same advice my mentor told me, um, which is think about the messaging that you're sending your students when you step into the classroom and what you said around um, children will listen and also listen to things that you don't say um, and things that they pick up on that. But one thing that I'm also really cognizant of, and I've given this advice so many times before, is I always tell queer teachers, be aware of your environment and assess your own personal risk, how much risk you want to take. And I say this because it, it's all fine and dandy for us to be like, yes, I'm going to be out. I'm going to do all those things. But if you're in a system or a school that just doesn't support that, you have administrators who don't support that, um, and you have colleagues that are, and you're just by yourself on an island, I wouldn't do it. Um, I would actually recommend that you find a different school because that's not the place uh, for you to be at. And also um, that school shouldn't exist if that is, um, a mindset that is being transferred over from staff member to staff member and um, indirectly and directly being transferred over to, to youth around this idea about um, how LGBTQ people should be rep represented um, in schools. And so um, I always tell people assess their environment, assess um, what their admin is like and their colleagues before um, sharing out your full identity. You always just want a group of people who will support you. Um, and that could be parents as well, um, because a lot of parents and community members had my back um, in a lot of those years. And in my opinion, um, parents and community is always greater than admin. hundred <laughs> percent. I, I agree with that entirely. It's funny, like I got this messaging when I started at my first school that was like, the community is so important. If the community doesn't like you, then you won't be here long. Right. And then I got the same messaging from some parents, like we're not really quite sure what you're doing in with your program and we want you to stick around. Mm -hmm. And it was like a it was like a subtle threat. And I was like, okay, well, I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing. And I stayed there for a while and I became the teacher of the year and I did all of these things. Yeah. Like, uh, and for the most part, the community loved me. It's that that small portion of the community makes a lot of noise yes. if they don't like something. Right. And, and it's always it was enough noise for me to want to leave. Yeah, for sure. A hundred percent. And I always say, um, you do want to find a place where again, you have people who will back you up, but like they, it's more than acceptance. It's just, um, they really just like nurture you and love you. And I just want to say this y'all, because I just learned about this the other day. I mean, a, a year ago, 
so I, I used to say to myself, I just want to be accepted. And then I found these like layers of like, um, not even acceptance of for LGBTQ people, like what should you receive? And I found out that acceptance is only in the middle. There's like four more levels that I was so unaware of. And I was like, oh, that is exactly what I need. It's like, I want to be nurtured. I want to be lo- like all these different words. And I was like, wow, I had a low bar going with like, oh, I just want to be accepted in so a lot of these I places. I talked about this on the, very, on the last episode. We talked about how like, we're in a much better place. We moved on from tolerance. Right? Yes. yes. And now we're here at this place that's middle ground, which is acceptance. And I'm like, great, let's push for affirmation, which is like a step up, right? Yes. But then there's all these other things. There's so many other things above I that. And teachers that. love a hierarchy. <laughs> oh, yes. They love a hierarchy. But I will tell you, I was shook because I was just like, wow, I was really aiming for the for uh, bare minimum. <laughs> Uh, yeah, absolutely. I, I talked with a college professor, gosh, it must have been like three or four episodes ago, who, who mentioned this uh, hierarchy with like nurture and affirmation and all these things above acceptance. And I was like, shoot, people keep telling us acceptance is what we should want, but it's literally the bare minimum at this point. Is. Yeah. Um, and so I guess to the educator, I wouldn't aim for acceptance. Like I would aim for something much higher. Look, there are schools out there that will affirm you, that will love you, and they will nurture you, and you should go find those schools. Absolutely. And so then that brings me to my next question is, what do you think that the school community can do to be more inclusive of 2S LGBTQIA plus people? Yes. So this was all, this is like part of the reason why I'm doing um, House of Legends. Um, work as Great. well. Great. This is a good segue because um, that's going to yeah. be the next thing we talk about. I So Glisten... Um, their national school climate survey, um, where the, a large percentage of, st- of LGBTQ students say, and this was their headline, that schools are hostile and not safe for LGBTQ students. That's yep, unacceptable. I remember seeing that. Yeah, 100%. that is so unacceptable. And back to our conversation about acceptance, I think schools are not even at acceptance, we're at tolerable. Like, at bare minimum, we're at tolerance. And so I, so when you ask the question, what should schools do? There's a lot of things schools should do. And um, I think a, lo- a lot of um, prescriptive things they think they should do are pronouns, bare minimum. Like that should just be there. Um, the gender neutral bathrooms, that should be there. Like that, that all those things should be there. Um doing the nice PD about LGBTQ people in the beginning, great. But you ha- it has to be more than that. And so I, I'm, in the, I'm in a little of a space where I don't even, I, I, I want school systems to be fixed, but I'm learning a lot how school systems are just broken and they're just repeating the same thing over and over again, make things a little bit better and then they go back a little bit. And so I'm into the space of let's create our own spaces. Like let's start creating... Um, schools that are queer centered and that um, schools that are run by queer, queer um, teachers, queer educators. And like, it's a school for everyone, but we're centering our queer youth um, in the middle. And so I think a lot about um, school um, changing uh, or creating new schools, but I also I'm thinking about like third spaces. Um, And in some cases, how do we work alongside with schools to create um, these spaces as inclusive rather than just, um, oh, a ch- another check off my list. I, we did pronouns check. Um, and so that is my, that's always my answer when they're like, what should schools do? And at this point I'm like, mm, I think we should create our own, um, spaces. And I think that in, in history, that's just what it is. Like we don't see what we, we, we don't see what we see in the norm. So let's create our own, um, let's do the revolution. I- kind of right there with you on that and it's funny because this episode is like repeating so much of the last episode that i just had because (laughs) i'm just sitting there going like yep queer schools um that's that's where i see fit and imagine like if we did that how many people would be like oh the audacity yeah something like that but meanwhile like christian schools and catholic schools right and jewish schools and any kind of like right 
group i mean homeschooling is predominantly religious like granted right. queerness is not a religion i mean we right. could be God, i do is beautiful yes. <laughs> i do want to share um house of legends I was, um, I was, I got greenlit to open it as a micro school in Chicago. So um, I was ready. I was with, ready with recruitment. I will say, if it wasn't for my other mentor, Caroline Hill, um, she, I was in an innovative micro school program, and my first iteration of the school was just a regular school because that's what just my thoughts were. And then she said to me, "Your innovation is found in your story. Think about it." And I was like. I hear you and I'm doing it. And so I will say during that process, I was getting a lot of feedback from people around, this is too unapologetic. Like you're not, it's not going to open. You have to frame that it's for everybody, even if it's for centered for queer youth, like a lot of language had to change and I didn't change it. I left it all in there. Um, And I did get greenlit, but then March, 2020 happens. (laughs) And Everything just flew out the window. I waited a year and a half and they, they ended up using the funds for um, COVID relief, but um, mm-hmm. fair. And I was so sad because then now I've been on this journey of like, how do I bring this back up? Um, but I am excited because I'm just doing a lot of pilot work at this point and I'm trying to imagine and reimagine schooling um, and education in a way that doesn't mimic what we're already seeing in our schools. Yep, I'm here for that. And when you get to piloting in New York City, you give me a call because I will yes. gladly join the ranks on that one. Yeah, yeah. Are you from New York City? I live in New York City. I'm from oh. Los Angeles, but I okay. am here now. Nice. Um, at this point, I want to turn over the mic to you and give you the opportunity to ask me a question. Uh, so take it away. Yeah. Um, one question I'm thinking about is what, okay, so what, what kind of school, um, describe a school that is queer centered to you. Oh, gosh. I don't even know. Cause you got me thinking about like pedagogy and the changes in pedagogy over time and how like we went into this, like pedagogy changes with the workforce kind mm-hmm. of. And I feel like one in a queer environment, I think that it's almost backward. I think of Greeks and I think of how the humanities were a top priority and the humanities were learned and expressed through the arts. Yeah. Um, so I see a lot of art happening. Mm-hmm. And while I do think math and science and all of those things the core subjects are still a requirement. I think that there are ways to express them differently than they're being expressed. And I think that by unlocking creativity, utilizing artistic minds, right, you'll actually find that impossible problems will get solved. Yes. Because we're thinking more creative, uh, creatively as opposed to kind of reproducing the things that have always been done. I mean, what, an 11-year-old solved an impossible math problem the other day or a couple of months ago? I don't even remember. But this, you know, young child solved this incredibly impossible math problem that people have been working on for maybe their whole careers. Right. And I think that if we unlocked that creativity problem solving will become a lot easier. I also think that the school would be community focused. Yes. And so I think that there would be, because queer communities have had to exist out of necessity and hiding, this would be a place where queer community to exist, not as a necessity, but as a requirement. Yeah. Of like, of growth, not of living. Right. Um, Yes. And I think what will be beautiful of that is the repercussion of that in adulthood is that the queer identity won't be entirely linked to alcoholism because a lot of queer identity is linked to alcoholism because our queer communities existed within hidden bars for so long, generations and generations. Um, And so then 
by creating this community at a younger age, we're actually able to instill what the community could look like in the future. Mm. So those are kind of like things that come to my mind because I think, I don't know, I'm not here for, a, you know, Socratic seminar or whatnot, though I do think that that has a place within this kind of setting. I'm here for understanding as a theater teacher, there are things from all of the curriculum, from every class that can be expressed through performance art or through yeah. building something or through yeah. making a costume or painting uh, or creating a song or whatever the situation is you can express your knowledge in a creative way and it will be actually more effective to your learning and re retention of that information than you pass the test. Right. Facts. 100%. Well, Andre, I've really enjoyed our conversation tonight and I just want to thank you for taking some time out of your evening to sit and talk with me today. Yes. Thank you so much for having me. I was so excited and really happy to have this conversation with y'all. It is my pleasure. Please hit us up on social media with more updates of the House of Legends as things move along because the people yeah. are going to want to know. Yes. Um, and then thank you all for tuning in to this episode wherever you are. I hope you have an amazing day. Bye. <laughs>